It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to episode number 80 of the Great Writers Share podcast, where every week we hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join us on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date is Tuesday the 16th of March and we'll dive right in with my personal update. So as always, I'm going to split this into non-fiction and into fiction because they're the two threads of the business I'm currently running. Um, and there's a lot going on at the minute. So in non-fiction, um, I spent most of yesterday working out basically strategizing my entire business because I felt like for a long time there was something missing in terms of I have quarterly goals I have sort of yearly goals but I don't know what my main sort of north star is in terms of you know what the big goals I'm trying to achieve and doing all of this for Um, and I've had some idea for ages but I've never really formalized it so I sat down um, on zoom with a right friend and we went through and uh, kind of brainstormed and very very pleased managed to actually pull that together and come up with something that I'm very very happy with in terms of three overarching themes and goals that I'm going to try and be hitting over the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, however long it takes. Um, hopefully not that long, but, you know, <laughs> sometime. Um, and within that as well, I've gone through and I was feeling a lot of overwhelm in terms of the amount of stuff that I've currently been working on, the things I've committed to. Um, for, pe- for people that are long-term listeners of this show or the next level authors or just familiar with, with me, uh, I do tend to say yes to a lot of stuff and get very enthusiastic about a lot of stuff and I'm very very optimistic in terms of how much I believe I can do with my time so uh, I've had to go through and basically look at all the things I've currently committed to see the horror that unfolded before myself um, and then you know figure out well maybe this is the reason I keep burning out all the time so I have worked to prioritize the things I currently have open Um, I've got some stuff I'm going to say no to I've got some stuff that um, I'm going to double down on because that's actually more uh, you know, they, they lead towards the big goals I'm trying to reach. So um, it's all it's all strategizing. It's all trying to fit it in together. Um, and that was quite a big day. So I'm a bit burned out from that. But it is exciting stuff to go forward to. And I feel really sort of um, optimistic about where that's going to lead. As part of that, um, I am still chugging along with my self-publishing blueprint. So I am approaching the end of my second round of edits. Very, very happy with how the books come out and how it sits. Um I feel very, very confident in the content I've put inside. I believe I might have added a couple of chapters paying attention to things that I've not seen in any other books about how to self-publish your book. So hopefully that'll be a useful resource for people who are looking at getting into the writing sphere and um, just at the beginning of their journey. It's settling in at the minute about 30,000 words. Um, I reckon that probably stick around that to be fair. Um, and then I've got to just work out where it's going next in terms of edits, getting it published and you know all sort of launch strategy around that so that's upcoming in fiction news i've actually uh in the last couple of weeks signed with a pr agent and i can't remember if i said this in my last um update but uh i'm i very much enjoy marketing and i enjoy the sort of psychology behind selling a book to people and all the strategy behind that what i'm not fond of massively is paid ads facebook ads amazon ads all that kind of stuff which are kind of um, a necessary evil but what I'm hoping to do with this agent is, you know, hopefully with any luck. I mean, he, they, they've already started to do it, uh, is put me on shows in front of audiences that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to reach. So I've already had sort of a number of um, blog bookings, a number of vlogs, YouTube, radio, things that I'm going to be appearing on over the, the coming weeks and months, which is very, very exciting. And um, like I say, the, it's, it's a different form of marketing. It allows me to sort of reach those audiences that I don't really have any access to. So I'm very excited to see where that's going to lead and the opportunities that might bring. But for those of you following me on social media, you might see a lot more of those recordings actually posted around and sort of sharing bits and pieces from those interviews, which have been quite fun. Um, one of those, I was on the Stephen King podcast last week, which was a lot of fun with a guy called Lou Sitzmer. And uh, we had a chat all about horror, Stephen King and uh, When Winter Comes, which is, of course, my, my most recent fiction book. So lots of that upcoming. And speaking of When Winter Comes, that's my 
next in my sights to actually finish. So I've spoken a lot about the novella that uh, I want to be working on um, and I definitely will be working on it and I have worked on it a little bit, but I'm going to finish when winter comes to get that into a standard in which it's ready for hardback collection, box setting it, all that kind of good stuff because I'm really excited to get it on the shelf and also that's uh, another thing off of my plate that's kind of hanging around at the minute. So exciting for that, I believe. I'm going to be looking at sort of around middle of the year for a release on that and like I say yeah it's going to be it's going to be fun watching that all come together considering the experimental nature of what When Winter Comes was. Today's guest is the winner of the 2020 Kindle Award for Best Horror and Suspense book Jennifer Ann Gordon and Jennifer was an absolute delight to talk to it's always nice geeking out with someone about horror um specifically Jennifer centers herself within the brand of gothic horror and she writes sort of very very deep very atmospheric horror which is you know I've read some of her stuff and it's absolutely beautiful um, we talk a lot about experimenting with different art forms. We talk about how dancers influence writing. We talk about you know how you take your how you go from taking your debut novel to uh, an award winner and how you then work on that next book. So there's lots of sort of process, lots of mindset stuff here to to get past um, that will be beneficial for everyone. So all that's to come. But now, without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one and the only Jennifer Ann Gordon. Jennifer Ann Gordon was born a strange, pale and quiet child, a ghost scared of ghosts. Originally from New Hampshire, she studied acting at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. She grew up to become an actress, magician's assistant, artist, writer, dancer and muse. She currently haunts lonely places in New Hampshire, though she is not dead. Her debut novel, Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, earned Jennifer the Kindle Award for Best Horror Suspense 2020, the Best Horror 2020 in the Authors on the Air Awards, and was a finalist for both the American Book Fest's Book Year Award, Best Book Award, Horror 2020, and the Authors on the Air Book of the Year Award. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. No worries. I'm very, very excited to speak to you. And I wanted to jump straight into, um, basically, I've looked at your bio, and you do a lot of very creative stuff. But one thing that particularly stood out and on another interview that I heard you speak about was this relationship between dancing and writing. And I wondered whether you could give a little highlight on on how that works for you just just to the listeners, because I think that's such a beautiful sentiment to to compare the two. Um, So, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for reading my bio. Um, So pre-COVID, pre-lockdown, I was and I was a professional ballroom dancer and a professional performer. And uh, I taught ballroom dancing. So there's uh, I like to think of my writing and my dancing is very similar. When I dance, uh, my dance partner, my husband and I, all we do is improvise. We don't make a plan. We just go out there and we do it. So if somebody says, okay, you're going to perform a tango. We don't even listen to the song beforehand. We just go for it. We are the pantsers of dance. Amazing. We're, we're dance pantsers. <laughs> um, so, and, and I'm, I'm like that with my writing too. I just don't really know. i I, I know what I'm going to do. Like I'm going to write a werewolf story. And then I, I try not to plan very much. I just think of characters and go with it. Um, I also think my writing style in particular has a musicality to it. There's a lyrical nature to it. I use uh, repetitive words and phrases to build rhythm, not because I don't know other words, but uh <laughs> So, cause some people are like, never use the same phrase twice. And I'm like, I do it all the time. It's mm-hmm. my style. Uh, so I do it for musical reasons, language reasons. And when I write, I also say all the words out loud, which is my dog hates it. As you're <laughs> writing that first draft. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll like, you know, vomit out a paragraph. And then sometimes if I go back, I, I reread it out loud and I do voices and stuff. Again, nobody likes that except me. <laughs> but that, that comes back to, you know, that first draft being the door closed, you doing it for you. I mean, it, it's yes. a process that obviously seems to work for you. I mean, it's, it's gotten you a, a host of goodies, which we will dive into <laughs> very, very shortly. Um, but just for the benefit of my listeners, obviously, we sort of touched on, you know, some of the successes you've had over the past year or so, a bit of, you know, your creative background. But where, how is it that you got your, your start into writing? Oh, I think I've always, I've always written just since I was a little kid. I was an only child, so there wasn't a lot of people to play with sometimes. So I always wrote little stories. I remember I was maybe nine or 10 and I wrote a legal drama or what I thought was a legal drama, like a courtroom drama. And I made my mother act it out with me. And I didn't know anything, obviously, about 
courtrooms or or legality or what lawyers were really everyone knows to at do. nine years old I know I, I played like every role I was just like mom you're gonna be just all the witnesses I'm the judge I'm both lawyers I'm everybody but they were in my brain all the same character so yeah I just always wrote uh, in seventh grade I was bullied really really badly by kids in my school so I ended up eating lunch in my teacher's classroom most of the time and if I was going to be in there she was like you should you should be writing you should do something mm. and I would just she would give me notebook after notebook and I would just fill the pages with you know terrible seventh grade short stories uh, so and then after that I switched to poetry for many years and dabbled a little in some freelance journalism mm. And, and it's fair kept, to say that you're... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and I think I always wanted to write novels, but I got it in my head that I, I couldn't because it seemed like such a huge commitment. And since I'm a pantser, I thought people who write novels must know what they're doing. They must know how it's going to end and who the characters are. And then I realized you might you might not need that. <laughs> you could just go for it. What brought you to that realisation? Because I'm, I'm very much in a similar camp. I, I always say that if there's a spectrum of uh, pants to plotter, and one is Panzer, complete Panzer, and number 10 is Plotter. I'm somewhere around three or four. Um, but yeah. I know that when I approached my first novel, it was very much pantsing my way through. But what was it that for you, like you say, that was a barrier for you to think that, you know, how do you how, how do people pants their way to the end? What was it that got you past that into actually writing that book? So um, I started writing a different book first. I started writing my novel From Daylight to Madness, which is Victorian era horror. And I was researching and researching and writing down facts and circling things in books. And I wasn't getting any further in my getting in front of the computer screen and just typing out the fricking words. Like I was just, <laughs> um, so, and I, and I really had gotten tired of telling myself I couldn't do something. So when my mom's health took a turn for the worse, I gave up, uh, I, I ran a burlesque troupe for many years, a burlesque and cabaret troupe. So I gave that up to spend more time at home with my mom and I needed a creative outlet. So that's when I was like, I'm going to write a book. Uh, so I tried to write from daylight to madness, didn't work. And I remembered this idea I had like 20 years ago when I was in college for what I thought was going to be a, a play and it didn't work as a play when I tried to write it. And then about 10 years after that, I tried to write it as a graphic novel, but couldn't find an artist that I had uh, the right connection with to create it. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll just like, as a writing exercise, take this idea, my idea for beautiful, frightening and silent. And maybe it's a short story. Maybe it's a novella. Maybe it's just a writing exercise. I don't know. And I, I just started writing that book and it, it literally like exploded out of me. It just, I, I, I wrote every day for hours at a time and, and I didn't know if anybody would read it, want to read it, if it made sense. A lot of it's written in free verse poetry, which I know a lot of people don't necessarily clamor for, but. But obviously mm. hit, hit the right vein, <laughs> it seems. Um, and we definitely will dive into that. I'm trying to be deliberate in, pushing that back a minute because I'm, I'm very very hungry to kind of discuss all that success with you and, and how you got there <laughs> that's okay um how has it has it always been horror with you because obviously the the books that you're working on at the minute it's very um your your brand I think it's fair to say is gothic it's you know the horror it's it's the dark has it always been that way for you or is that something that you sort of found over time um I think writing fiction it's always been horror or dark related I I can't imagine writing a comedy or like a, a romance. I, f I feel like there's some romantic elements to my stories, but, but it's not a romance at all. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of light. You know, if you read my reviews, there are some that are just like, oh, this was depressing and awful. And I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> that is what I was going for though, because it was about somebody whose whole family died. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, I've just always been, it's my favorite genre to read. It's my favorite genre to uh, watch TV shows of movies. It's my go-to. I blame reading Pet Cemetery when I was 10. 
I thought it was about a cat. Back to Pet Cemetery. <laughs> I know because it it had a damn cat on the cover, and mm-hmm. I thought this is definitely for children, isn't it? <laughs> I knew it wasn't for kids because yeah, I yeah. like lifted it out of my uncle's bedroom when he was mm-hmm. staying at our house. And I was just like, let me take that. Let me go hide behind my dollhouse and see what this book is about. And uh, yeah, scarred ever since. Mm. And what Somewhere was about- between that and loving um, Nightmare on Elm Street when nice. I was like 11. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And what was it about that book that kind of spoke to you? Because I, I get this a lot. You know, I my main entry into horror was Cujo. Um, oh, yeah and then again with an animal <laughs> again with an animal and uh that, that was sort of around the age of 15 for me and then I, I went on to more king and went into pet cemetery which sticks with me to this very very day <sighs> um but you know lots of people listen to this show sort of all different genres so many people don't understand the the appeal of horror and that dark side yeah. and you know I have my my thoughts and feelings on what horror is but obviously you're the guest on the show and people are here to listen to, <laughs> to you so I'm really interested to know what is it specifically about the horror that does speak to you or gives you that outlet that you're looking for? Um, well, I will say, I'm going to bring it back to Pet Cemetery for a mm-hmm. second. That book was the first experience I had with not only terror, like absolute terror, but also reading about grief and reading about kind of family trauma in a way that wasn't my family trauma, wasn't my family grief. So I I think I was drawn to it for that reason. I thought it was a really interesting way to express things that I as a child and then I, myself as a teenager and even now as a as a grown-up, these are air quotes, grown-up. <laughs> um, it's easier to express uh, certain emotions and certain feelings when you veil it in horror, I think. That, and there's like a pleasurable terror, at least to me, that I just... I love, I love, you know, it's it's like when you are standing on a roof and you think, oh, I, what if I jumped? (laughs) And it's just like that, that thing, or like there's a fire and you're like, if I put my hand in there, my hand would burn off. You don't put your hand in there, but you could. You could. And in horror (laughs) novels is the hand in the fire. It's like, Mm -hmm. what would, that's what would happen. Like Mm -hmm. it's uh, allowing yourself to you know, experience the the darkest parts of your own psyche without physically being harmed yourself, which is a bonus for me because I hate pain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what were the main influences that went from you know down that journey into um, your your latest books? What what who who could you attribute some of those influences to? Because you say you're very um, lyrical. I have read uh, some of. Um, so the title is just totally gone from my head, although I've literally just read it out. Beautiful, frightening, silent. Um, did I get that in the right order? Yes, you did. Yes, perfect. You did. Um, Sometimes but, even I don't get it out in the right yeah. order. I'm like, <laughs> frightening, beautiful, and yeah, whatever. Yeah. But now I've been um, working my way through it, and it is very, very lyrical. It is very, um, it feels quite etheric, very, very gothic, which obviously I think is the style you're going for, and just very dark. There's an atmosphere to what you write. And yes. is, are there certain authors that, you know, inspired that style in you? Uh, well, of course, King. Of, of course, King. He's just he, there, the epitome. Um, Shirley Jackson is mm-hmm. my go-to favorite. If if Shirley Jackson didn't write Haunting of Hill House, I don't I don't know what my world would be like, to be honest. Um, so Shirley Jackson, of course. Um, gosh, almost everything. Like I love uh, Edith Wharton which I know sounds really strange because she's Age of Innocence and House of Mirth, but she also wrote Victorian era ghost stories, which to me, I was so intrigued by them because they were um, A, ahead of their time. B, it was really bringing horror into the home because she was a woman. And and I loved that. Also, I love her book, uh, Ethan Frome, because it's probably the most atmospheric novel short novel I've ever read in my life. So yeah, Shirley Jackson, Edith Wharton, uh, of course, V.C. Andrews, because I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and Flowers in the Attic, all of those twisted gothic family things. Uh, Daphne du Maurier is another uh, huge influence with Rebecca. And yeah, my cousin Rachel, amazing. Mm-hmm. 
good good selection there what um so when you came about writing the beautiful frightening and silent um you said it yourself you just had this idea you wanted to get it out it was just in you it just came to the page um at the time were you sort of looking down the line of the where you were going to position the book when it was going to be published out there were you looking at different um channels that you could publish it through were you looking at trying to reach these particular awards or was it literally just an experience of I'm going to write my best book because this is just for me at that point? Yeah, it was really just write my best book. And even as I was writing it, I didn't think about other people reading it, if that makes sense. Like I had beta readers that were reading it, but I didn't think of like people I didn't know picking up a book that I wrote and and reading it and you know, uh, complaining about it on Goodreads. I'd never expected that to be my future. Uh, And it's it's amazing how quickly it can happen, like to go from like being a writer or a dabbler into being an author. Mm. It's, yeah, so um, yeah, I just, I wrote it. And then I remember I had really just finished like the first draft or maybe the second draft and Pit Mad happened. Uh, for people who are listening to this who don't know what Pit Mad is, it's a one-day Twitter pitch festival, short for Pitch Madness, where you pitch your book in 240 characters or less. And if if people like it, if agents like it, if publishers like it, they give it a heart and it you can go on from there. And I, I remember it got a few hearts and that was shocking. And nothing came of that, but that's what made me go, oh crap, I should probably learn how to write a query letter. And, and that it was, if it wasn't for pit mad and me just jumping into that, because I had a couple of friends that I met in a writing group saying, you should do pit mad. Come on, you finished your book. And I was like, yeah, sure. I, I don't, I really don't think I would have thought about the book being out there. I think that was like the, the kick in my pants that I needed to just say, all right, let's try to put it out there. And then I remember um, somebody wrote a blog about like the 10 best pitches of Pit Mad that for that specific Pit Mad and my book ended up there. And I was just like, oh, maybe, maybe this is something. <laughs> and something, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, so, um, so yeah, the, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so when you finished that first draft, Again, obviously, this is your first novel that you tackled. Did you? How did you approach the editing process? Was it sort of heavy editing from your side, or were you sort of? It, it sounds like as you write through, you're kind of going back to edit the voice anyway, in terms of sort of speaking out, do the characters and stuff. So, was it heavy editing, or was it sort of ready to to ship? In your opinion, um, no, it was definitely not ready for anything. And I mean, even now, I love that book, and it won awards, and I love that. But when I read it now, I'm just like, oh, I would do it so much different now. But I. I'm a firm believer in once I say a project's done, like it, it's done, I can't keep fussing with it or else I'll kill it. Like it'll, <laughs> it'll become something completely different. Mm-hmm. But so yeah, after the first draft, it was definitely not done. So then I just, and I remember it was probably only about 55,000 words when I had first written it. And And it was all just like telling, no showing, no anything. It was just like, this is what happens. And I think in the first draft, you tell the story to yourself so you don't forget it. And then drafts two through whatever, five, six, however many people use, that's when you start to like shape the story for somebody else and shade in uh, the characters and the atmosphere and turn it from a just like a coloring book line drawing into hopefully a, a piece of art. What was the journey from finishing that book to the day that you discovered that you'd won the Kindle Best Horror Suspense 2020? Um, it, was a, it was a slightly messy journey, to be honest. Uh, I was with a, a small press for a little while and then I I realized I wanted to start self-publishing. So um, for for reasons, I left the small press and then I republished on my own. I got the book re-edited, I, you know, and then I, I self-published on my own. And 
but in that whole process, you start learning about marketing and being out there and getting your name out there and what your brand is and who you are and what other people expect you to be. And all of that's weirdly important that I didn't think about when I just published the book. And I'm like, okay, that's, I'm done. Like wipe my hands of it. So uh, very quickly, I realized the book was doing well sales wise for me, for an indie book was doing well. And I wanted to take it to a higher level. So I entered a few, uh, you know, contests, competitions, writing competitions, entered the book into a few things, and then honestly, completely forgot about it. Just like the Kindle Award, I remember entering and then forgetting about it completely until many, many, many months later, a friend of mine emailed me and she said, did you know your book is a semi-finalist for the Kindle Awards? And I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot I even was in the Kindle Awards. <laughs> like, I forgot that. So I looked at the website and I was like, oh, my book made it to the top 20 for horror. That's amazing. And, and I just thought, well, it was all worth it because now I have a badge that says I'm a semi-finalist. And, and I was so, so happy. It was like winning an Oscar. And then <laughs> the next month, they announced the finalists, which were the top five per category. And I became a finalist. And again, I was just like, holy cow, this is, this is so crazy that it's happened. And another good friend of mine who actually writes romance, she became a finalist in her category. So we together were like, I can't believe this happened. Um, everything in life is good. We have this little badge we can put on our books. And then they were announcing the winners on, I remember it was November 1st. And October 31st, I got married. So I thought, I'm definitely not winning this. Like, I'm just going to concentrate on my, my getting married. But then, um, you know, I got married and it was great. But in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was just like, I'm just going to check, just check to see if the winners are out. And the winners weren't out because it was the middle of the night. And I honestly checked, I think like every hour I kept waking up and I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to check. Nope, still not out. And then around seven that morning, I went to check again because I'm neurotic and I had an email from a friend of mine who had also been neurotically checking in the middle of the night. And she said, congratulations. And I was just like, that, I can't be real. I can't believe this. Um, to think that like I would win an award that not only um, I kind of forgot about, but it was it's a decent award. It came with like a cash prize. Mm -hmm. It came with, you know... Um, $600 worth of advertising. Like, it was just like, oh, I can't believe I, I won money for a book that I wrote that it took me 20 years. And I, I would say, it took me 20 years to build up the courage and like three months to write it. <laughs> <laughs> was that how long that first sort of draft took you? Was three months? Um, the first draft, I think, was actually a, about two and a half months, which is very fast for me because I don't write that fast. Mm -hmm. I don't write that fast now. I don't know how I did it then. Just sometimes the, the muse just takes you. But I mean, yeah. congratulations. That is a, obviously a fantastic um, achievement for you uh, on a debut novel as well. And obviously there's the sort of list of the, the other awards that you got um, finalists for or actually won. And I guess from that, the question then springs, how, how did you approach going from that book into the next one? Because I can imagine that in terms of you, your own self expectation, sort of the reputation that then comes, there's got to be that's got to affect you in some way when it comes to writing that next book. Well, um, I was lucky that I Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent wasn't even published yet when I had started writing From Daylight to Madness. I finally kind of gave myself the courage to write From Daylight to Madness because I already had, you know, I had done the research, I knew at least a little bit more about the Victorian era than I had before. And I figured everything else I would just research as I went. Like, are there window screens in 1873? Or do they use the word restaurant? No, to both of those things. Um, so uh, I, I had a really, I had about half of From Daylight to Madness, I think, done before uh, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent really was starting to gain some traction. So I wasn't scared 
of, oh no, what if it's not as good? Or what if it's too similar? What if it's not similar enough? What if my fans hate it? Um, I didn't have that with From Daylight to Madness during the creation process. And luckily From Daylight to Madness and the sequel to that, When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk, I originally was writing as one long, 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 long book that I ended up chopping in half. So the writing process for that was not really impeded by my, you know, sophomore slump fear of what happens if it's not for beautiful, frightening and silent. And how much so traction, it, how much traction did that all give you? Cause obviously, um, you know, you, you're working as an artist, you're doing all, all, all your photography and everything else anyway. How much of a boost did that Kindle award give you in terms of uh, building a fan base and rolling from that or? Um, you know, I'm not, sh I don't know. I don't know. I know it's been better since I won the award. <laughs> so, um, I'm assuming that probably it didn't hurt because, um, yeah, my, before I won it, my second book was being published. Like it was already out. It had just come out. And for whatever reason, uh, from daylight to madness sold like shockingly well I thought for again for me for an indie book when I got my numbers back from my debut I was just like oh how did this even happen because <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't know I didn't have a team I had like a little bit of a team but I don't have the team I have with me now that was helping me now I have a great publicist I have Mickey Mickelson mm -hmm. from Creative Edge which I believe he is your publicist he is yes as well fantastic guy um very, very good. And I signed with him about two weeks before I won the Kindle Award. Because I remember when I won the Kindle Award, I messaged him and he was just like, you don't even need me. I'm like, no, 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 I need you. <laughs> yes, please. I need yes, you. Please. <laughs> yes, no, actually, I very, really, very much need you. Um, so things have been going a lot smoother since I've gotten him as, a, as my publicist. It's just mm. been, it makes my life easier. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we we touched on earlier the fact that um, in terms of your sort of author brand, your creative brand, it's very gothic in style. Obviously, the intro is all about sort of like ghosts and pale and all, and all that kind of stuff. Um, when when did you start curating that brand and how, how important do you think building a visual brand is like that to a creative? Um, so I'm very lucky when I my brand is actually me, like it's who I was. Even in high school, I was wearing, you know, black, pale skin, dark red lipstick, combat boots. I was always, I was always that girl. So I didn't have to think about what my brand per se would be. I already was that. And I think the books are an extension of who I am. That being said, if I did have this like thought in my head, like I wanted to write a real bubbly chick not chick like a chiclet rom-com thing like really bubbly goofy I would probably do it under a pseudonym because that wouldn't fit in with mm. where my books are now and I think people who read my books now and really enjoy them some of them would like a, a chiclet book of course uh, but some wouldn't and I don't want to give people expectations of something that they're not going to enjoy mm. yeah i've definitely been down that path with them um, so i write uh, well i have experimented with sort of post apoc with sci-fi um horror is always the bed that i end up coming back to but i found that even bringing people over from uh, a horror infused post apoc to a straight horror is very very difficult because they are just different in terms of the flavor that comes from that they story they are they are so i've just i have a book with my editor now that is I, I like people can't see me, but I'm like holding my head. <laughs> um, I love this book so much and my beta readers are loving it, but it is very different because it's not gothic horror. It is more, um, it, there is a horror element to it for sure. There's a little um, body horror, light body horror um, mixed with just like straight literary fiction. So it's, it's like horror adjacent, <laughs> but it's not, uh, there is a ghost, but I, again, it's all just like used in a different way than I usually use them. So um, I'm excited. I'm really excited for people to read it, but I know 
there's going to be a few of my, I think my diehard, like beautiful, frightening and silent, just the best book ever people that are going to read it and go, Oh, Mm. you know, what, what happened to Dagger Island? Because I've written three books and they've all taken place on a fictional Island off the coast of Maine. And that is not the case for this book. It is. There are some Dagger Island Easter eggs in there for my fans, but it does not take place there. Um, It's very contemporary. It's, of course, it's about a virus, but again, I, it was pre-COVID when they <laughs> came up with this idea. Um, but it's it's about a virus that kind of like eats people's faces off. And it's a story of an Instagram influencer and a politician and how basically the end of the world affects them hmm. um, in both their very selfish outward appearances, but also um, they have a lot of like uh, deep trauma that stems from their childhoods that uh, kind of plays into how you feel about the world ending if you're kind of dead inside. Sounds like a book I want to read. When's it out? (laughs) Uh, End of June. (laughs) Beautiful. So much to look forward to. I'll put that in the show notes for people. Um, We've touched on all these different facets of of art that obviously compose who who you are as a person. Um, With this question, I'd like to sort of pull back a little bit and ask a very, very big question, which is what is art to you and what does that give you in terms of um, life and enjoyment and, and what you do? For me, art is communication. It's it's how I've always communicated. Because believe it or not, when I was a kid, I was shy. <laughs> and um, and my first, my first like, you know, foray into art was dance. And I thought it was an amazing way to communicate without having to talk. And from dance, I moved on to theater. And again, it, it was a really great way for somebody who had a low self-esteem to communicate and to express themselves because I got to be somebody else. So I got to, and again, this is kind of like the horror lens. I got to express myself through a lens of somebody else's words. And that was freeing. So art is communication for me. It's a way to tell a story tell my story without it being my story. I don't know. I don't know if it makes sense, but I also can't do math and science. So I only have the arts to fall back on. (laughs) So where does magician's assistant fall into all that? (laughs) Um, So I went to school for theater. I went to the New Hampshire Institute of Art and I was involved in their theater program. And there was a professional theater company that was run through the college. So I got to work uh, on a lot of professional shows when I was young, just kind of like training. And I met a performer who was really great. um, And he had kind of a side business where he was a psychic entertainer, which is, um, is is a type of magic, quote unquote magic magician. But it's not like the pulling a rabbit out of a hat or sawing a lady in half. But uh, so I started working with him because he needed, he was doing a tour uh, through New England that I helped book. And then I ended up being kind of part of the the show, which was very fun. I got to wear like a cool red velvet cloak and nice. be, be all <laughs> mysterious. So we he, he did... Um, like uh, psychic entertaining uh, seances, readings, things like that, like cold readings for people. Um, it was it was really interesting. It was fun. And it's always just fun to have that on the resume because it always makes people go, wait, what? Yeah. You did what for a job? <laughs> I just, I, I love just the concept of how all of that sort of um, magic works and, I think it definitely plays a lot into some of the stuff that you can create with horror. I know that one thing that I'm very, very excited to do once the pandemic and everything is gone is I really want to experience it like a a real seance and go and sort of be a part of that because there's so many of those little pockets of other sideness that are just ignored by the general mainstream that obviously inform a lot of what we do. And like you say, horror is exploration of the stuff that we can't normally explore. So I really like to dive into those cracks and see those. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I got, um, working for a psychic entertainer, I got very, um, I don't want to say obsessed, but interested in like the birth of the spiritualist movement in the Victorian mm. era, where, you know, these 
you know, upper crust people were inviting mediums into their house and they were having seances all the time. And people were like, so death obsessed. Um, and, and to me, I'm like, that's so cool. But most people <laughs> are like, yeah, God. That is fascinating. Death. It is fascinating. I take a weekly uh, writing class, which is a, a grief writing class. So we explore uh, death and and feelings around death in creative in different ways on a weekly basis. And it's amazing. Amazing. Some of the people in the class are, are you know, psychologists and death dumas and nurses and people who have experienced grief, people who are afraid of grief, writers, non-writers. That's, yeah. That sounds perfect. I might have to hunt for something like that. Um, um, I, I will give you the information. <laughs> I will send it to you. I'll go all the way over to New Hampshire. <laughs> no, it's online. It's online. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah, we'll yeah. talk after this. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and obviously, like, like you say, that you get, you seem to get very um, uh, fascinated. You're very, very curious about all these different elements. Um, a lot of your work is informed by times gone by. How is it you manage all your research? What's your process when it comes to storing this stuff in your head and trying to get that sort of accuracy onto the page while it mixes with your fiction? Um, I think for me, I start with the character. So if my character is doing something um, that I believe in, I think my readers will believe in it. But I do, obviously, the things that happened in the past, I do have to fact check but I, I try not to, I, I learned my lesson with From Daylight to Madness when I got bogged down in the research and, it, and I kept thinking, I can't do anything until I know everything about the year 1873. And I hired a genealogist and I had uh, census forms for like poor houses in Maine and, and all of that was good because it informed my decisions, but it wasn't anything that ever really ended up on the page. So I think of, I think now the same type of research I did when I was uh, acting, when I was going to school for theater and when I was uh, acting on stage, I just go to it the same way of research. So I just research the character, like what would this character need and do? What are their motivations emotionally, physically? And what is their job? Okay, I can research their job, but I don't need to research every single thing about 1873. Mm. I just need to know what my character would have been interested in. <laughs> and do you still a, uh, a pantser now? Or have you found that your process has changed from that first book? Um, I think I'm probably closer to where you are, like a, maybe like mm. a 3-4. Three, 3-4, four. Three, four. I'm, yeah. I'm a planter. <laughs> I, like now I think... Um, and I, I think it will also change on the project, but my last book that the one that's with my editor right now, uh, which will be out this summer, it's called Pretty Ugly. Uh, I knew the beginning, I knew the inciting incident, and I knew the end. Hmm. And I kind of knew, I'm like, at some point they're going to have to get to Italy because uh, <laughs> they've got to be on this like death train. Okay, I'll figure out how to get them there because... Instead of just starting the book in Italy, I thought I started it like, you know, in New Hampshire where I live. Mm. And how do people get, you know, across the globe during the, right before the world ends? Yeah. Which, you know, it's not like current times aren't good research. <laughs> I know, exactly. I'm like, well, great. I'm, maybe it is a good thing I'm writing this book about a plague during a plague. Mm-hmm. It helps. It helps. Um, and obviously you mentioned that Pretty Ugly coming later this summer. Um, what's next for you after that? You, is it sort of strictly looking at the writing? Are you still playing all arenas? What What's sort of next for you? Um, I've been concentrating on the writing because, because uh, ideally that's where I want to be in life. I would like this to be my, my sole focus. I do still dabble in some dance and I will probably always dabble in uh, performing and teaching and choreography again once the world is not just our bedrooms mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> because there there are no performances now um so currently right now i'm working on uh, a collection of short stories which is i've never done a collection of short stories and i'm having fun kind of turning some tropes completely upside down like mm-hmm. things that i'm like i would never write a werewolf story and I'm writing a werewolf story, <laughs> but but my, werewolf my story. version yeah. of a werewolf story. Um, 
So, you know, my friends who know I'm writing something, they're just like, how's the wolf going? How's your wolf story? I'm like, it's good. Just so you know, there's not a werewolf in my werewolf story. And they're just like, <laughs> of course there's not. <laughs> there, it is. there it is. Yeah. I'm like, no werewolf to be found yet, but maybe. <laughs> is there any art form that doesn't interest you? Hmm. I mean, I'm interested in all of them. There's ones that I don't have it. I don't, I don't have an interest in learning. Like I don't, I don't have a burning desire to learn to play the guitar or learn to play an instrument. I feel like my time has come and gone on that. I missed <laughs> my chance when I was a kid. Uh, and that's fine. I enjoy music. My husband's a musician. I'm a dancer. I enjoy music, obviously, but I don't have a desire to express myself through music at all. Um, trying to think or and like and i wouldn't want to like make a sculpture <laughs> like, yeah that's never really taken me to be like, fair i wouldn't want to like blacksmith mm -hmm. but oh, trying to think of like blacksmith. but it's so cool <laughs> yeah just just for the sound and the just the glow of the fire and obviously like i probably look nothing like i'm envisioning in my head <laughs> but there's something sort of uh romantic and magical about just yeah i know I, I know i know a lot of uh real life blacksmiths and every time they talk about it they're so passionate and it's amazing and i think god that does sound cool but then i know like i would probably smash my hand like completely to pieces because I just yeah it's a lot of like hammering yeah, yeah, yeah. and like hot <laughs> fire and, and you have a lot of yeah. hair so that's that's just a hazard. I know <laughs> it is a hazard it is a hazard when I was in high school I used to smoke true story and I threw a cigarette out a car window which you don't do anymore but back when I was in, came back lit my hair on fire oh, no. <laughs> also I wasn't exactly uh sober at the time so uh -oh. it took me a second to go <laughs> oh i think there's something burning in the car and then like my friend being like dude it's your hair and i'm like ah. oh man so that yeah sucks. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that's yeah. been a long time ago but still kind of on brand i think for me would be that would be yeah. an on brand story <laughs> yeah. well we are getting close to time and before we dive into our quick fire round uh, i'm gonna ask you one question we ask every guest that comes on this show which is why do you, Jennifer and Gordon, write? Oh, um, because I don't have health insurance and I don't have medication to make me not crazy. So I have to put it into a book. There. Love it. Absolutely. I know. It. I'm like, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm just going to say words. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Um, okay, so we're at the quick fire round now. What I have in front of me are 10 questions that I'm going to throw at you as quickly as possible. Um, it's all in good fun. Some of them are uh, multiple choice. Some of them are just whichever comes to your head first. Um, you can pass if you want to. Um, it's like I say, it's <gasps> all in good fun. So, um, oh my, oh, hold on, let me take a sip of water. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll <laughs> like, take mine as well. I, I feel like it's a game show. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want, you can try and go for the record, which was uh, twenty four seconds by uh, Jonathan Yanez. Um, but he he he's a very competitive guy, and he smashed <laughs> smash straight through it. So there's no expectation. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't think I can do. I don't think I can do twenty four seconds. It was impressive. It was yeah. It was, it was swift. Um, are you ready? yes beautiful halloween or nightmare on elm street halloween when was the last time you trick-or-treated uh um 10 years ago have you ever scared yourself with your own writing yes victorian or georgian horror <gasps> victorian uh, favorite writer of all time shirley jackson what was the last book you read good neighbors by sarah langan what's the scariest monster you've encountered real or fictional that's, um, my ex-husband. What's your dream holiday destination? Oh, um, Scotland. How many bones have you broken? One. What's your go-to horror anthem? Horror anthem, like horror song? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, the entire, there's an entire album by uh, a dark ambient author, author, artist called Raisin Detra. I cannot remember, or Raisin Diot. Uh, I can't remember the name of the album, but it's his, I think it's his fourth has the hollow can... yeah anything anything by him is actually my anthem because it all sounds like a haunted house screaming nice i'll see if i can find that put it in the show notes and that is 10 questions i do have one bonus question which is where can my listeners find out everything about you and all that you're working on um the easiest place is actually just to go straight to my website which is jenniferangordon.com and that is Anne with an e 
A-N-N-E, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N.com. That has links to all of my social media. Um, I'm mostly active on Facebook and Instagram, but I am on Twitter. I'm not very clever on Twitter, so low <laughs> expectations if you follow me on Twitter. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, it's been a blast chatting with you. Thank you so much. No worries. And thank you everyone for listening and we will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Join me next week when I'll be joined by your Great Writer Share co-hosts, Holly Line, John Crennan and Faye Trusk. Until next time. <laughs>